This afternoon we conclude a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments, and we will be focusing on the Tenth Commandment this afternoon as well as uh, the commandments as a whole. And in preparation for that, let's read together from the book of Acts. Uh, I direct your attention to chapter 20, Acts 20, beginning at verse 17, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. So we pick up the story of Paul on one of his missionary journeys. It'll be his last one. Verse 17, this is God's word. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of, everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So I preach to you God's word this afternoon. Um, God's word as we find it summarized in Lord's Day 44 of the Heidelberg Catechism. You can find that with me on page 558. 558. Lord, say 44, what does the 10th commandment require of us? That not even the slightest thought or desire contrary to any of God's commandments should ever arise in our heart. Rather, with all our heart, we should always hate all sin and delight in all righteousness. But can those converted to God keep these commandments perfectly? No. In this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning of this obedience. 
Nevertheless, with earnest purpose, they do begin to live not only according to some, but to all the commandments of God. And finally, if in this life no one can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly, why does God have them preach so strictly? First, so that throughout our life we may more and more become aware of our sinful nature and therefore seek more eagerly the forgiveness of sins and righteousness in Christ. Second, so that while praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may never stop striving to be renewed more and more after God's image until after this life we reach the goal of perfection. So brothers and sisters, when considering the 10th commandment, then we see that we are entering into a whole new world of sorts. The whole world of thoughts and desires, of musings, of contemplations of the heart. Right? That's how our catechism puts it as well. Not even the slightest thought or desire, contrary to any of God's commandments, should ever arise in our heart. And then not only a world of thoughts and desires and of musings and of contemplations of the heart, but the Tenth Commandment is also speaking to emotions of the heart. Our catechism there speaks about how we want to always hate all sin and conversely to delight in all righteousness. So what's really important to see regarding the Tenth Commandment is that this is the only commandment of the Ten that there is no outward action associated with it. Uh, There's no negative or positive actions, outward actions that are addressed. But rather, the Tenth Commandment deals only with the heart. It speaks to the covetousness of the heart, which we learn from God's Word is the root. The heart is the root. And so covetousness that comes from that heart becomes the wellspring of all disobedience forbidden by the other commandments. So in this way, the Tenth Commandment is a very special commandment. It's only addressing the heart, but in that light we also see how it addresses all the other commandments from which our desires and our coveting may lead to uh, bad and um, disobedient action. So, We hear God's word summarized this afternoon under this theme, God asks not only for a blameless life, but also a pure heart. You could say God is not only addressing our outward actions through the commandments, but he's also speaking to the root and to the heart of all our actions. God asks not only for a blameless life, but also a pure heart. We'll see first the heart as a source. Second, the fruits which spring up. And three, the the joy that stays. So first, the heart as a source. One thing we understand from the Holy Scriptures is that as an inward action, coveting, is not necessarily a bad thing, but a good thing. The actual word that we read in Scripture simply means to desire or to take pleasure in. And the Scriptures speak a lot about good desires. God even has many good desires, and God addresses in his word the many things he desires of us. And so also people 
can desire or covet good things. For example, we might covet prayers during a time of great need. We may covet holiness or covet covet patterns in our lives which lead to, to happiness and contentment and comfort. But in the 10th commandment, we must understand, at least in the wording of the commandment, covet in a negative sense, in a bad sense. You shall not covet. Here it, it means to long for, to lust after, to take pleasure in wrong things. It's addressing selfish desire idolatrous tendencies, the desire uh, to take pleasure in something that is wrong and forbidden and unlawful. It, it's addressing wanting what we cannot have. And in that sense too, we're not to covet our neighbor's wife. We're not to covet our neighbor's property. We're not to covet our neighbor's house. We're not to covet our neighbor's animals. And of course, in the setting of the Israelites, those animals would have been referring to transportation and and indeed also to those instruments that they needed to, to work the land. So you could say, God is saying, You shall not covet your neighbor's tractor or combine or barn. The time when the Ten Commandments were given, God is addressing the taking pleasure in false gods and false worship. God is addressing the evil desires that arises in the hearts of sinful men. And in the 10th commandment, God is asking us for a pure heart in which lust and hate and envy and greed have no place. In other words, in the 10th commandment, God is calling us to deal with the root or the very source of all sin. He is obligating us to slay sin, not just outwardly, but at its very root. He wants us to plug the well from which all other sins spring. Now here you see then how the Ten Commandment relates to the commandments that have come from before. And the Tenth Commandment therefore serves well as a final commandment. God's commandments concerning murder and adultery or theft and slander all spring from the covetous heart. Wrong thoughts nourish wrong desires which give birth to wrong actions. In other words, this is exactly what James is addressing in chapter 1, verse 13 and following, when he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's James 1. Now, beloved, when we consider then the heart as the source of sin and the commandment that God wants us to deal with that sin at its very root, the heart, in all of this, we we are reminded that the 10th commandment, you shall not covet, we're reminded of the fact that God also is able to see the heart, to know what is in the heart. 
In God's eyes, all things are revealed. Consider this. God cares as much about our outward actions as he does of our inward thoughts and motives from which those actions proceed. That is to say, the good deeds we do mean nothing to God if they're done from selfish, legalistic, or covetous basis. And it's in this regard that we realize how the Mosaic Law is far more advanced than any other ancient law code. For we should realize that the Ten Commandments is not the only law book of the ancient world. Most societies, most nations also surrounding Israel had its set of laws that had to be followed. Those laws were in place in order to maintain order and control of society. But the thing about those pagan nations is that those laws only stopped or always stopped at the deeds. Few of those law codes ever addressed words and none of them addressed the thoughts of the heart. Here we see how God's covenant law is so unique and that how for his people, God has given a most advanced law, a law that is in existence from the beginning of creation until today and will be until Christ returns. There are two ideals by which men mold their lives. One is making God the center of all things. The other is making the self the center. One is saying, God, your will be done. The other is saying, my will be done. And it is in the heart of the latter, my will be done, where is where covetousness has a home. Where all things are being considered from day to day in relation to how to gratify the self. And this light we see that it is not sufficient to simply refrain from sinful actions, which is what all those other law codes and also today any law code Any constitution will be, it's insufficient, unless we also consider what takes place in the heart, which is what the law of God does. Sometimes laws and other social checks and balances will prevent people from fulfilling certain actions. But it says nothing and does nothing for what is happening in their hearts. The sight of a police car can make us slow down and drive the speed limit. We can obey the law outwardly, and that's good for society, but it does not address the heart. And our hearts, as you know, want to speed. A child wants to take a cookie or a candy from the table, but will not do so because mother is looking and watching. But that rule or law for that moment does not address the desires of the child's heart. A man can refrain from adultery or theft because of social penalties attached to such transgressions, but he can still in his inmost heart be an adulterer and a thief. 
Although these laws and moral codes are good and they protect us and they protect society as a whole, the Ten Commandments show us, and especially the Tenth Commandment does, that the refraining of certain outward actions is not good enough. So considering all this, this truth is so humbling, isn't it? Well, we learn this afternoon, brothers and sisters, as we realize that obedience to God's law is ultimately about what is in the heart, we learn that the only remedy for our sinful hearts is a radical one. It will start by cutting at the root of selfishness, getting to the root of sin. And that also, by the way, doesn't start with us, but it starts with God when He, and not man, is the center of the universe. And when God also acts so that we can act. And so we see in our second place, the fruits which spring up. As believers, as Christians, we must look to God to help us to not only obey God's will outwardly, but especially from the heart. And this is exactly why, brothers and sisters, God has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth so that we can kill sin at the root We need a Savior, one who is not only a man, but also a righteous man, one who was born without sin, who received a heart that was not polluted by Adam's sin, one who would live a perfect life so that he was undeserving of death, so that by dying, he could bear our sins upon himself and that by rising again, he can offer us a new life. And being exalted in heaven can give us the Holy Spirit to work renewal in our hearts. And thus in Christ, and in the preaching of Jesus Christ, God's will is also preached to us all the time, regularly. And that's what is also meant, by the way, when it says in the third question, why does God have the Ten Commandments preached so strictly? Strictly means that all the time, regularly. Through the regular preaching of God's law, we will be constantly reminded and therefore convicted of our sins, not only our outward actions, but also the corruption of our hearts, And we will be reminded of and called to believe in Jesus Christ. And we will be led by His Spirit to newness of life. So what then is God's will? It is that which corresponds to His character, which is ultimately that God is love. To live in God's sight is to live in the light of love. We must pray that by the power of Christ's Holy Spirit in us, that instead of selfishness and sin and corruption in our hearts, that God will kindle in us true love. And that in this way, there is also power to expel selfishness. The love of Christ in us purifies our hearts and guards our thoughts and disciplines our desires. And thus, God's will and His catechism, uh, sorry, and His commandments are truly a positive thing because by means of the commandments, God can lead us and guide us to delight in all righteousness. From the 10th commandment, beloved, we can learn that there is much good we can do. 
to one another. Covetousness can give place to a gracious and and generous disposition. That's how Paul put it as well when he spoke to the Ephesians. He talked, first of all, how he was not motivated by selfishness all all the time that he was a Christian and he worked among God's people. But he was motivated by the love of God in Christ Jesus so that he could say with Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In Acts 20, Paul truly explains and shows and demonstrates how his love for God and for Jesus Christ translates into his love for Christ's church and for the people of Ephesus and how that compelled him to meet with them one last time even though he had no time for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem. Paul, in our passage, shows how he puts himself last to take time to minister to those he loves. He encourages them to live the life of faith, especially because he believes he will never see them again. And that's an interesting point as well, that Paul says that, that he is certain that he will not see those elders in Ephesus again. Why does he say that? Well, he tells them how the Holy Spirit has put it upon his heart that suffering and persecution and possibly even death awaits him. He knows that his faith in Jesus Christ is going to lead to difficulties and hardships. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts, purifying our hearts, beloved, translating our hearts from selfishness to selflessness. If Paul was selfish, he would not go that distance to suffer difficulties and hardships for Christ. But he, only, he does only that instead what is helpful to his neighbor. He will do what is necessary for his neighbor, even if he has to give up his very life. It truly is amazing, brothers and sisters, what the Spirit can do in us like he did in Paul. At one time, Paul was indeed self-righteous. He was a keeper of the external law. At heart, he was covetousness and a lover of the self. But our passage shows that he is completely changed and transformed so that he can quote his Savior, his Lord, his Master, his Teacher, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. This, these words describe the very life of Jesus himself and how he sacrificed his life for us. And so we are led to ask ourselves today as well as we consider the 10th commandment, beloved, what about us? How is it with us now concerning our hearts? And then we come to the third point, the joy that stays. What we learn from Scripture, what we learn from the Catechism echoing the Scriptures, is that when our hearts are changed and when the Holy Spirit dwells in us and and we are purifying our hearts, then in obedience to God from the heart, joy and peace and contentment enters us. Indeed, we experience a lasting joy, a joy that is not fleeting, a a joy that is not one that is satisfied for the moment, but a joy, a kind of joy that lasts. 
It's not the kind of joy that comes from selfishness or covetousness that is often quickly replaced with bitterness and anger and emptiness and craving for more. But this is a joy that comes from selflessness. It's the joy that also that little acronym teaches us the letters of the word joy. Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. It's the very joy that Paul also declares in our passage and shows in our passage. A joy that speaks to and leads to resoluteness. Willingness to suffer for Christ's sake. Willingness to to give things up for the help and aid of others. It's a joy and a peace and a contentment that is evident in his tears, as well as the weeping of his friends. Which, by the way, could have made Paul reconsider, but rather Paul, in his highest joy, would rather serve his master to the end, so that he's even willing to die for Christ's name if that is necessary. Beloved, God's word and the 10th commandment is encouraging us to believe that it is truly more blessed to give than to receive. It's encouraging us through faith to have pure hearts for God and His will and for the other. It is teaching us that there is joy, pure joy in contentment and in peace, and in faith in Christ. And so, we can conclude. This afternoon, we finish a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments. We see that the tenth is different than the others. It does not speak to outward actions, but it addresses the inner thoughts and desires of the heart. And yet, we have seen that actually makes it connected to all the previous commandments. For the sinful heart is the source of all sin. And thus, when we get rid of that covetousness of the heart, we can avoid sin. And for that to happen, we need changed hearts. And that's why God sent His Son. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ came. That is why the gospel is preached, including when the commandments are preached. For we learn through that preaching that in Jesus Christ, through faith, our hearts will become wells from which forth spring good things. And we will be filled ultimately with the truest of joy, as we seek to live for the Lord more and more. Amen.